Bob Mary, what is your favorite Joe Alsop story? Oh, it's, it can be no favorite Joe Alsop story. There are so many Joe Alsop stories. But I find that some of the funnier ones are the Alsop stories that are kind of small, about small little episodes, because they tell so much about Joe. Uh, Joe Alsop, the columnist, uh, Georgetown uh, um, host, um, would frequently bring guest sources into his house for afternoon drinks. And one day he had a scientist, a military scientist whom he had never met before. And uh, he brought in a few other younger reporters, which he always liked to do because they knew what questions to ask, and he didn't always in his later years. And he said, uh, now, uh, uh, Dr. Rubel, can you tell me? And uh, Dr. Rubel, uh, after he's finished, said, uh, well, yes, of course, uh, Mr. Alsop, but um, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor. I, I'm not a, I'm, I don't hold a Ph.D. And, and by the way, it's, it's, uh, it's pronounced Rubel. And Joe says, oh, yes, of course. Now, Dr. Rubel, can you tell me? Uh, <laughs> it was sort of a little touch of the put down, and people couldn't quite figure out why Joe did that. But it was the sort of thing that he constantly did. Who was Stuart Alsop? Stuart Alsop was Joe's brother, four years his junior. Um, I believe that uh, in the later years of their lives, Stuart Alsop emerges as the greater journalist. But for most of their lives, Stuart lived in the shadow of Joe. Um, they wrote a column together. Joe brought, him in to, brought his brother Stuart into the column writing business and um, insisted that he be the senior columnist, while Stuart was the junior columnist. And uh, Stuart ultimately chafed under that. It uh, really was etched into their relationship in a 55-45 split of the proceeds of their column writing and magazine writing together. So he split with Joe in 1958 after 10 years, uh, after 12 years, and uh, became a magazine writer of some note um, for the next uh, uh, decade. Here's a picture of uh, Joe Alsop when he was thinner. I think it was about 1948. And below that is a picture of his brother Stuart, um, along with uh, Randolph Churchill. What, uh, why with Randolph Churchill? Well, the Alsops... Um, were Anglophiles. In fact, their whole class of people, the old Anglo-Saxon elite of America, and they were charter members of that um, class of Americans, um, were Anglophiles. It was drummed into their heads at uh, prep school at Groton and further at uh, Harvard and Yale and Princeton. They went to Harvard and Yale. Um, and it went so far as when Stuart, uh, after Pearl Harbor, couldn't get a combat job in U.S. forces because of high blood pressure, he joined the British Army and became a platoon leader, a, a lieutenant in the uh, British uh, Rifle Corps, uh, and fought in uh, the Italian campaign, went to North Africa, and later became a Jedburgh. He uh, parachuted behind the lines in France uh, right after D-Day to help the French resistance, um, um, help the Allies move forward in the continent. Um, and uh, Stuart befriended uh, Randolph Churchill, and Joe did too, and uh, in fact, Stuart wrote a marvelous little essay about a lunch he had at Chartwell in which uh, Churchill was having lunch and Randolph invited Stuart. He thought it would be maybe 12 or 15 people and it turned out to be just Winston Churchill and Randolph Churchill and Stuart. And Winston was, uh, Sir Winston was, uh, didn't seem too amused to have this interloper at his table. He, he uh, just sort of harumped through the first course. Uh, maybe a little bit more than harumphing through the second course. But after a little bit of uh, a nice claret, he began to open up, and then he began to speak expansively. And it's a marvelous little tale about a little lunch with uh, the Churchills. But it was typical of the Alsops. They always managed to get um, in the company of the high and the mighty throughout the world. Randolph Churchill married Pam. Pam Harriman. Oh, now uh, later Pam Harriman, yeah. Our ambassador to France. Right. Married to Abraham. One of the things you keep seeing in all the circles in this, all the connections. Uh, you, you have a picture here from 1937 of a heavy Joe Alsop. What happened to all the weight? Joe weighed probably at that point over 250 pounds, and he was 5 feet 9 inches. Um, and he was working at that time, that was about 1937 probably. He was working as a uh, uh, columnist, young columnist and magazine writer for the Saturday Evening Post, uh, working uh, just uh, endless hours, socializing endlessly, 
uh, drinking quite a little bit uh, socially. He always was a rather heavy drinker, not uh, to excess particularly uh, until perhaps his later life, but always a heavy social drinker. Uh, and uh, he began having rather serious uh, heart uh, trouble. Uh, the doctor said that if he didn't lose a significant amount of that uh, weight, uh, he wasn't sure that he'd last the year. His mother, his mother, by the way, was um, the first cousin of Eleanor Roosevelt and the, the, um, the niece of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, she went into a panic uh, at that, and she paid for Joe to go to Johns Hopkins University Hospital for a brand new program of um, uh, nutritional and dietary um, uh, regimen. And in, I think it was two to three months, he lost uh, 50 pounds. He never gained it back, but he always had a uh, difficult time with his weight, and he always would go to health spas at least once or twice a year. And Kay Graham told me another amusing story, that he had two separate wardrobes, two closets with two separate wardrobes, one for when he was gaining weight and he didn't want to have to go out and buy a bunch of new clothes, and, and one for when he uh, would return from his refreshing trips to the health spas and after having lost eight, eight, ten pounds. When did you first think this was a book? I, um, let's see, about six years ago, uh, I was doing a little research project for a book on um, uh, Senate leaders, and I did Robert Taft. And in the context of that study, a chapter on Robert Taft, I stumbled across the Alsop papers at the Library of Congress. Now, I had known about the Alsops. I had to Stuart when he was writing a, a very, very um, uh, wonderful column in Newsweek magazine in the late 60s, early 70s was just about my journalistic hero when I was in college and in the Army. And uh, so I knew a lot about the Ossops. I'd written about them, and I had uh, reviewed uh, their books uh, over the years. Uh, but, of course, Stuart had died in 74. Joe retired in 75, and so they were really not very current for a long time. Once I discovered the Ossop papers, which is just a treasure trove of historical gems, um, it occurred to me that what we have here is... Uh, a real window on the history of America from about 1935 to 1975, and that's what it turned out to be. How'd you go about doing the book? From what period of their lives to what period does this book cover? This book covers um, from 1910, essentially. Actually, I have to, I have to go back. The, the book really begins in 1660. When the, uh, there's a chapter on the genealogy of the Alsops, and there's a reason for that. The reason is that the uh, the book is really a story about the Alsops. It's a story about journalism. It's a story about Washington politics. It's a story about America and the post-war world. But more than anything else, aside from the brothers, it's a story about the old elite of America, which I call the old elite, the Anglo-Saxon establishment, um, and its decline. Uh, and in order to understand uh, that establishment, it was necessary to go back and explain briefly the genealogy of these two um, men. This is Joe Alsop on the right? Uh, that is him on the right and his sister on the left with their grandmother, um, Corinne Robinson, Corinne Roosevelt Robinson, who was the, sis the sister of Teddy Roosevelt. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. It's okay. Um, uh, and and uh, the Alsop family came over to America in the 1660s and within two generations had become extremely uh, prosperous in the shipping trade. Um, in fact, Joseph Wright Alsop II, uh, the Joe that I'm writing about was Joseph Wright Alsop V, so you go back three generations, was probably the richest man in America in his lifetime. Uh, but uh, so typical in America, there's upward mobility and there's downward mobility, and the family fortunes had declined significantly uh, by the time their father um, uh, graduated from Yale he pretty much had to start over, and he built a, a nice uh, living for himself as a farmer and insurance executive in Avon, Connecticut. Joe Alsop and Stuart Alsop were born where? They were born in Avon, Connecticut, in the uh, family farmhouse, uh, just uh, not too far from Hartford. Uh, it became a suburb of Hartford uh, years later. Um, and as I was saying, Joe um, was born in 1910, and uh, Stuart was born in 1914. So this, the guts of the story is really begins uh, at, the, at their life. It explains what life was like in a small Yankee town in, uh, in the, in the, um, uh, in the uh, Northeast uh, at the, around the turn of the century. What role did Groton play in their lives, and what is it? 
Groton played a huge role in their lives. Um, Groton is, I call it, the academic foundry where the nation's elite sent its sons to be uh, forged into uh, models of upper crust gentility. Uh, and Groton was founded by Endicott Peabody, who had gone to school in England at uh, Cheltenham in, uh, in England. And he, like all these people, were total Anglophiles, and he modeled his school on the um, English uh, boarding school model, the English pub, uh, uh, public school, as they call them. Uh, and the interesting thing about Groton is that Joe and Stuart both hated the place. There's a picture of Stuart at Groton? Just about the time he went to Groton. Um, and yet they never questioned its significance in, the, in the molding and shaping them as they uh, grew into manhood. And that was typical of that time. Years later, in the next generation, Stuart's children hated Groton. And uh, Stewart's reaction initially was, uh, well, you're supposed to hate prep school. You're supposed to hate boarding school. Um, but it, but um, uh, the children disliked it so much and wouldn't accept it, unlike the older generation, that they pulled, uh, they pulled one of their sons out of Groton and let him move on to another school. Where did the brothers go from Groton? Joe went to Harvard, where he, uh, I like to tell the Harvard story because Joe, Joe hated Groton for a number of reasons. The things that Groton prized Joe didn't have. Groton prized um, athletic ability. Joe had none. Groton prized kind of a rote, unimaginative intelligence. Joe was a man of uh, um, uh, highly imaginative intelligence uh, and uh, artistic uh, temperament. Um, and um, and um, Joe was also a fat young man, which wasn't very highly prized at Groton. So he was a very unhappy person at Groton and didn't have many friends for a good part of that time. He even wrote years later that it was the only time in his life where he ever s significantly considered um, uh, taking his own life. I don't know how seriously he really considered that, but it was significant, I think, that he wrote it years later. Uh, he went on to Harvard, where he discovered that people didn't care that much about whether you were an athlete or not. And his um, um, intellectual bent and his uh, ability to be amusing uh, caught on with his peers. And so he created himself. He really pretty much sort of redefined himself, created himself into a kind of a Dr. Johnson character. Uh, and it seemed to work. People were very highly amused. And the more they were amused, the more he played it up. And the more he played it up, the more uh, he was amused. And by the time uh, he got through his first year at uh, Harvard, he had really uh, uh, transformed himself into a flamboyant man with, with elaborate mannerisms and a, a sort of an ersatz British accent with the long vowels and clipped consonants. And that was sort of the role that he played for himself throughout the rest of his life. As you know, uh, we had a couple of sittings with him on tape, and we're mm -hmm. going to use a little bit of it in this interview. Uh, they were done in 1984. When did he die? Uh, Joe died in 1989. At what age? Well, he was born in 1910, so he was about 79. And in the interview that we did with him, we asked him about his experience at Harvard. Here's a minute of it. Let's take a yeah, look at what he looked like in 84. I was a rather friendless boy when I was little, and I made friends when I was 13, 14. I'd learned that it was a bore not to have friends. And, uh, and uh, they were going to Harvard, so I went to Harvard, that's all. And uh, it certainly wasn't an ideal educational ex experience, if you mean that. Um, I read enormously. I enjoyed myself enormously. I drank enormously. In fact, I'm a new I became a newspaper man because my family were afraid if I stayed at Harvard News, uh, Law School, which might have been my intention. I'd turn into a drunk, like all my mother's uncles. <laughs> Probably would have, too. Did you ever meet him? Never laid eyes on the man. Never did meet him. Does he sound there like, I mean, you write a lot about the affectation of the English accent. Does he sound like uh, he did all his life, do you think? I think it had receded, actually, a little bit in his later years, but, uh, but that was, that was uh, 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 pretty close to what he seemed like most of his life. When was he the most important uh, to this country, when he was writing that people were really paying attention to him? Uh, well, I'd answer that in two ways. He was the most influential by far in the early 60s, uh, during the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. 
he had reached his pinnacle. Uh, he was very close to the Kennedys, uh, both Jack and Jackie Kennedy. In fact, uh, his friendship with Jackie Kennedy was really a loving friendship. Uh, they had a lot of affection for each other. Um, uh, and he was very close to Lyndon Johnson. I tell a funny story about Lyndon Johnson. When Joe was a, a rising young columnist in Washington and Lyndon Johnson was a rising young congressman, because of his connection with Sam Rayburn, Lyndon Johnson would get invited down to the White House for um, strategy sessions, and he would slip a lot of good information to Joe um, as a good source. Well, after doing that for a while, you know, Johnson, uh, he felt like he should get a, a quid for his quid pro quo for his quo. And um, uh, so he asked, uh, uh, he sort of unabashedly asked Joe to write a, a kind of a, um, a column about what a great congressman he was. Well, Joe didn't think that would be quite appropriate to sort of use his uh, national column to promote um, uh, Johnson, but he didn't want to make him angry. So he went to his syndicate and asked, do you think it'd be all right if I wrote a column about Lyndon Johnson just for the Texas newspapers? And uh, he did that. <laughs> And it was sent down to the Texas newspapers, and Johnson uh, was mollified and felt that he had done a good turn. So they go back. They had gone back by the time Johnson became president a long, long ways, and they um, spoke a lot. Um, um, Joe and his wife, Susan Mary, were invited to the White House at those years for very intimate dinners, both under the uh, Kennedys and under the Johnsons. And uh, he had immense access, uh, tremendous access throughout the government in those years. So I would say that that was his uh, greatest uh, uh, point of greatest influence. Got but a picture here of the Stuart Alsop family. Uh, he was four years younger. Yes. And you say he wrote for the Saturday Evening Post and Newsweek. Later Newsweek. He wrote uh, for the Saturday Evening Post from the time of the immediate post-war period, even while he did a column with his brother Joe from 46 to 58. And then from 58 to 68, he wrote exclusively for the Saturday Evening Post. His wife is in this picture, Tish. That's Tish. Where Patricia. did he meet her? He met her when he was uh, this young uh, lieutenant uh, in the British Army in London. She was uh, very young, 12 years his junior, and she was working for British intelligence, although he didn't know that at the time. She was undercover. 18 or and 19 cover. years old? She was 18 when they were married. He was 30. What year was that that they married? I believe it was 1944. I'm pretty sure it was 44, yeah. You describe uh, the difficulty she had coming back to this country and getting into the family. Well, it was tough. Um, uh, the family was um, um, extremely well connected and, and um, um, very important and, and uh, hobnob with famous people. And she was this very, very young woman with didn't have much in the way of those kinds of experiences. And she was expected to sort of move right in. In fact, Joe's first dinner party after he moved back into his house in Georgetown there was the uh, French ambassador, there was um, Supreme Court justice, uh, there were a couple of senators, and uh, Joe asked Tish to act as hostess. So she said she would, although no doubt she was very nervous about it. And um, uh, at uh, one point in the dinner, she thought that the dinner was over, and so she rose to do as she had been instructed, to lead the women to their separate conversation, which was conventional in those days. And Joe kind of shrieked at her, uh, um, darling, we haven't had dessert yet. And so she had to kind of slink back to, um, to uh, the table. So it was not easy uh, uh, coming into the Alsop family in those days, to, especially if you were somebody like Tish Alsop. You know, another thing that uh, you write a lot about is the, the, the Sunday night parties. And we've done so many books here where those Sunday night parties are talked about. When did they happen? Who hosted them? Who went to them? Yeah, the, the Sunday night parties, I think, have, have taken on almost a legendary tone, and, and they didn't last as long as a lot of people think. It was an immediate post-war period, when, and it was not started by the Alsops, although they became a very significant part of them early on. I think the people who started it were Frank Wisner, uh, who was a CIA operative, um, and uh, his wife, Polly, who was uh, quite wealthy. They both were. Uh, and um, some other couples got together. I think it might have been Tracy Barnes, also of the CIA. And they soon invited uh, the Alsops. And the way it worked was, these were all young people, relatively, uh, and uh, they liked to entertain, but they had uh, young children. And so on Sunday evening, um, one of them would act as the host and hostess, uh, 
one of the homes would be the, the uh, locus of this uh, evening. And it would be kind of a potluck. Different people would bring uh, different uh, parts of the meal. Uh, there would be plenty of alcohol. And everyone who was part of the group would be allowed to invite um, a source or somebody that they dealt with in the government. So uh, they became quite raucous. In fact, Joe sort of rechristened them the Sunday night drunk. Um, but the Sunday night supper was uh, quite an institution. Now, it lasted, I would say, from about 1947 until the early 50s. Uh, and then they sort of, uh, they sort of petered out. The, is there anyone in, in this business? I mean, where do you work now? I'm executive editor of Congressional Quarterly. So it's a the print business. And, and is there anybody in this business today like the Allsop? No, I don't believe there is. First, you have to remember that in those days, print was king. I mean, really, it was the monarch of journalism. And if you were, if you were a columnist, then you were at the pinnacle of, of, of the monarchy, essentially. Uh, today, journalism is all fragmented. There's uh, all kinds of broadcast outlets. There's various kinds of um, uh, print media outlets. There's now new media and online distribution. And nobody can command that kind of, that, that, uh, that, um, that amount of, the, of a corner of the whole journalistic um, uh, facade uh, that somebody could in the Alsop's days. Um, so that's number one. Number two, they were, they were part and parcel, as I, as I um, um, repeat, of, of the connected families of America so that they had an entree that was natural and automatic that doesn't exist today. You would have to be a real grasper and uh, um, uh, somebody who was really a real climber today to have the kind of access that to the Alsops was just a natural, normal part of everyday life. You have a chapter of... Um both Stewart's relationship, Stuart also up here is a picture of, with the Kennedys, and um, below you see a picture of Joe also with Jack Kennedy. You have a chapter on each and their relationship to the Kennedy family. What was the difference? Uh, first, a note, uh, the lower picture there of Joe and uh, uh, John Kennedy, that was snapped by a, by a flash camera by Jackie after um, the uh, two couples, just the four of them, had dinner at the White House one night. Um, Stewart considered himself not a close friend of Kennedy, but a, quote, friendly acquaintance. Uh, and Stewart um, observed what we might call journalistic niceties uh, more assiduously than Joe did. Um, Stewart didn't believe in getting too close to uh, sources. And uh, he, he, could, he played tennis with them, and he would have dinner with them, but he didn't allow himself to, get, to become close friends of them. Uh, and Stewart angered the Kennedys on a number of occasions and actually had his access cut off. Um, Joe, on the other hand, was very close and uh, really fostered an ongoing uh, friendship with uh, both Jack and Jackie Kennedy. You have a picture here of Stuart Alsop and, and Robert McNamara. Um, and I know that in, in Joe Alsop's own book, he tells the story of his initial contact with Robert McNamara, where there was somebody in the room when he wanted to interview him and he said either he goes or I go and Mr. McNamara says he stays, he was a government official and Joe Alsop left. What was, what was the relationship between Joe Alsop and Stuart Alsop and the Pentagon? Stuart was closer to McNamara than Joe was. Uh, Stuart met McNamara shortly after the Kennedys took over at the uh, uh, plantation farm weekend uh, retreat farm of Paul Nitze the uh, noted American diplomat and, uh, and uh, go government official, uh, and liked him immediately. Uh, and he became a pretty good source of uh, Stewart. But uh, Stewart also was a critic of the U.S. military under the McNamara years. And um, uh, Joe was utterly uncritical about the military. Whatever the military did, Joe thought it was just about right because it was the American military and therefore it couldn't possibly be going wrong. Stewart practically predicted Vietnam um, uh, largely because he felt that the military, especially the army, uh, had become sort of top-heavy and bureaucratic and incapable, uh, lacking the kind of imagination it would take to um, really prosecute a war such as the Vietnam War. In the interview that uh, we did back in 1984, Joe Alsop told a story about when Mr. McNamara and Mr. Alsop got back together as it was, I guess, maybe it's in this clip, I don't know, let's run it and we'll get your reaction sure. to it. Sure. And the first breakfast 
Wait, in your home? Yes, I had a sort of garden room, looking out on the garden, with a lot of birds in it. And uh, at that time, I was experimenting with a toucan. Well, a toucan is a very beautiful bird, but its conversation is both loud and uninteresting. And it, it's what they call a soft feeder. In other words, it eats fruit. And the particular toucan I had uh, may have been overfed, I don't know. Also had the habit of eating fruit and spitting it out, causing a fearful mess. And friction on the kind of people having to clean up the mess. And the first time Bob McNamara and I were having breakfast, the toucan spat three quarters of a banana onto Bob McNamara's head, where the hair was already getting a little bit thin. <laughs> so he had to head wash before the conversation could go on. She was very good about it. <laughs> had you seen that before? I, I saw that some time ago. I'd forgotten about it, but that's a funny story. What, uh, you know, what other people did he have a relationship with that uh, ever turned sour uh, as he was covering them? Because you, you have a lot of letters in here that he sent back and forth of apology when he wrote too hard and things like that? He was always in uh, controversy with people. And um, I think probably the biggest example of that was Lyndon Johnson. I mentioned that he was close to Lyndon Johnson and was invited over for intimate little dinners of maybe six or eight people uh, quite frequently in the early years of the Johnson administration. But in, in 1964, there was one thing that Lyndon Johnson did not want to do and that was to get embroiled in Vietnam before the election. And Joe felt that um, things were going, were going south, were going sour in Vietnam in a very big way. And he began writing a series of columns, almost endlessly, Johnny One Note, on um, um, uh, the fearful uh, challenge and the lack of resolve that uh, the president seemed to be showing in the face of this fearsome challenge. And Johnson was getting increasingly angry. Um, and um, ultimately, Johnson just cut him off. There's a funny story that Jack Valenti, who worked for Lyndon Johnson, told me it was during this period, uh, some AP wire photos came over the president's desk, and, uh, and um, there was a helicopter, and out of the helicopter was coming a bunch of newsmen, and one of them was Joe Alsop. And Johnson just flew into a rage. He says, what's that SOB Alsop doing on one of my helicopters? And... <laughs> And, of course, it was a routine thing. All the newsmen used uh, U.S. Forces helicopters in Vietnam. But uh, Johnson said, uh, you call McNamara and find out how that happened. And he was just uh, almost beside himself with anger. And it was years before uh, Joe and Lyndon were able to sort of rekindle their friendship as a result of that uh, rupture. Where did you find the Alsop files? Well, they're scattered a little bit, but most of, almost all of Joe's papers are found at the Library of Congress. He went through them quite meticulously, and they're very well organized, and they, they begin in, um, really in their mid-30s and go all the way to the end of uh, uh, 75. Stewart's papers for the 12 years in which the two brothers wrote the column together are also at the Library of Congress, but from 1958 onward, those were a separate batch of papers, uh, kept separately, obviously, and he gave those papers to the Mugar Library at Boston University. So I had to go up to Boston, spend quite a little bit of time, and uh, get myself a young researcher from the Harvard School to, uh, from the JFK School, to uh, uh, go through those papers with me. Did you take a leave of absence? Uh, I can't say that I did, really. I did take at one point towards the end of 1992, because of the presidential campaign, I, I really found it harder and harder to um, maintain my, my pace. And so at the end of that year, when things slowed down, I took uh, essentially about two months off uh, to sort of get back on course, which I managed to do. You have a dedication here in this book um, to your mother. My mother. And you also tell us that both your mother and father spent a lot of time on this book. Well, my mother came back here um, uh, to uh, go through the Library of Congress papers uh, for me. I didn't have enough time to devote to the papers themselves as I had wanted to go through and look for what I wanted. And uh, she was very interested in the project. And so I said, well, would you like to come back? Um, of course, was she? she was in Gig Harbor, Washington, where I grew up. 
And uh, would you like to come back and go through? She just retired from her job as a hospital um, executive and um, go through the papers. And, and she wasn't sure that she could make any kind of a contribution. I said, well, come back and try it and uh, see what happens. So she did, and um, uh, she had a great time. She just loved it. And she died in the middle of all this? She had cancer, and she did, yeah. What she, year? Uh, 93. What about your dad? My dad was a retired uh, newspaper executive. He was an editor of the Tacoma News Tribune in Tacoma, Washington, a newspaper of about 150,000 circulation, and um, also has a, a master's degree in English literature from Cornell. So uh, he was uh, uh, pretty accomplished as an editor, and uh, he went through the manuscript painstakingly numerous, numerous times for each chapter, and every time he found something new that he thought could be improved, and uh, it was it was uh, the kind of assistance and help that um, you couldn't find from anybody other than somebody that was uh, that had a, a loving relationship with you. How many people did you interview? I don't remember exactly, but I think it's about a hundred. Who did you spend the most time with? I spent it, uh, by far the most time with uh, Tish Alsop, uh, Stewart's widow. I spent um, uh, quite a bit of time, numerous interviews with Susan Mary Alsop, who was Joe's wife. Uh, for 13 years. Where is this picture from? That picture, as I recall, was taken at uh, the wedding of one of Susan Mary's uh, children, uh, and that would have been probably in the l probably early 70s or around the turn of the decade. The, the Joseph Alsop personal story uh, has been alluded to in a number of places, but you seem to go into much more detail. How hard was that to tell? Well, I tried to handle it quite sensitively. Joe was homosexual. Um, he um, lived in the closet of a, of a, of a uh, secret uh, life um, through most of his life. Um, and he had uh, uh, a couple of episodes that uh, were somewhat threatening, really, as a result of that. One uh, famous episode now occurred in Moscow where he um, had a homosexual encounter with a young man and it was all captured uh, by... Um, KGB, actually NKVD, the predecessor of the KGB uh, photographers, his room was rigged and they attempted to turn him into an agent of influence. Basically, um, we're going to blackmail you unless you give us a lot of information about what's going on in Washington. Uh, Joe was pretty foolish to get himself into that kind of a situation in Moscow, but he handled it from that moment uh, quite, quite well. He was totally arrogant, as was his want. He was an arrogant man. Uh, to these uh, operatives of the um, um, Soviet intelligence, and he went immediately to the U.S. Embassy, where the ambassador was his very good friend, Chip Bolin. Of course, the man was very well connected, as we've noted. Uh, and Chip uh, and his friend, uh, Frank Wisner of the CIA and others, uh, sort of rallied around uh, and um, uh, got him out of the country. Uh, and um, um, basically, he managed to... Uh, escape that episode, and there's no evidence that he ever succumbed to the pressures that were put upon him. And there were some subsequent pressures, apparently, when some of those photos were uh, mailed to various people in Washington years later, at a point when he was writing some particularly vociferous columns against the Soviet Union. When did the fact uh, that uh, Joe Alsop was homosexual become public first? Um, I, I believe it first became public by, in a story by Jack Nelson of the LA Times, um, uh, bouncing off of a previous book um, written by Ed Yoder, which is a kind of somewhat narrowly framed book of a particular part of the Alsop brothers' lives. Uh, and he goes into that somewhat, and Jack Nelson wrote about it before his book came out. You talk about an instance uh, where his friend Berlin? Isaiah Berlin. Mm -hmm. Who was he? Uh, Sir Isaiah Berlin is a, a sort of the quintessential Oxford Don of the 20th century. He's one of the prodigious intellectuals of, um, of uh, England uh, and a very, very close friend of Joe Alsop's, probably his closest friend. But it, when Joe Alsop told him he was a homosexual, what was Mr. Berlin's reaction? Well, it was late at night, and they, they frequently, they didn't get to see each other all that often, maybe a, a few times a year because they lived on either side of the Atlantic. Um, and, one, and when they did, they frequently would spend um, a long, late evening hours, almost into the wee uh, morning hours, uh, drinking and talking and gossiping and arguing uh, over intellectual subjects. And um, one night, in one of those sessions, Joe wanted to tell Sir Isaiah something, and he said, Isaiah, 
I have, and it's clear that he had a hard time getting this out. He said, I, uh, I, I, uh, I have something I, I, I want to tell you. And Isaiah was quite, um, um, uh, he was brought up a bit, and uh, I said, well, of course, Joe, what, what, what is it? He said, I, I, am, I, I am a homosexual. Well, Sir Isaiah wanted to handle it as sensitively as he, as he possibly could, and he simply said, oh, Joe, uh, everybody knows that, nobody cares. And Joe was clearly taken aback by his offhand response. It's not clear whether it was because Sir Isaiah was saying that his deep, dark secret was not a secret at all, um, or whether, he was, whether it was because he was suggesting that it wasn't of the magnitude that it seemed to be to Joe. And Isaiah said later that it was, uh, I think he used the word insensitive, or cruel even, but it was not intended to be cruel. It was just a very difficult, delicate subject and it was very hard to talk about. Did Susan Mary also, and her name was Patton? Her, she was uh, initially Susan Mary J. She was of uh, the longtime American J family, another part of the Anglo-Saxon, what, what Joe called the Wasp Ascendancy. Uh, her, uh, she was a directly descended from John J, uh, the famous um, uh, Revolutionary War era diplomat. Um, uh, and then she married Bill Patton, who was one of Joe Alsop's closest friends, a Harvard classmate and a former roommate in New York um, after Harvard. Uh, and um, uh, then when he died, he, he, had, uh, he was infirm. He, he had emphysema, <clears throat> and uh, he died in 1960. And Joe proposed to her relatively shortly thereafter, and they were married probably about a year after. Did she know that he was a homosexual? Susan Mary told me that she did not know he was a homosexual throughout their longtime friendship, very close friendship. When he wrote to her to propose to her, he revealed to her that he was, in fact, homosexual. And he did indicate to her that what he was proposing was a platonic marriage. But he indicated that he didn't see any reason why it couldn't be a, a very uh, happy and loving um, um, relationship. She initially um, delicately and sensitively uh, declined the proposal, but uh, some months later he was in Paris and uh, she was living in Paris at the time. She and her husband had lived there for 15 years uh, after the war and um, uh, she decided that uh, she would uh, marry Joe and they were married in very early weeks of 1961. I believe it was in February. You also tell a story about pictures and Charlie Bartlett. Who was Charlie Bartlett? Is he still alive? And what, is it, what was the picture story? And how did you find that, by the way? <clears throat> it wasn't easy. I stumbled across it, actually. Um, uh, Charlie Bartlett was a uh, Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist and a very close friend of John Kennedy. And he's the man who introduced Jack and Jackie Kennedy um, and was, uh, was in uh, the Kennedy wedding. Um, and he uh, was practicing his columnist trade in around, I want to say, 1970, 1970, I would say, and maybe 72. Um, uh, and he received a packet in the mail, which he opened up, and it was um, uh, some photographs of uh, Joe uh, in the middle of a um, uh, homosexual encounter uh, with another man. Um, he was uh, shocked to be receiving such a thing. Uh, it wasn't any of his business. He didn't really have any desire to um, be in the middle of any such thing, and he didn't know, have any idea where it had come from. But he suspected that there was uh, some kind of um, international shenanigan being played, and so he contacted some friends of his at the CIA. They told him, uh, they subsequently told him, they said, we'll get back to you, and they called and said, uh, send the photos over to Joe. Well, it, it was important that he send the photos over to Joe because Joe had heard in the meantime, and he had received word of this from the CIA people, that another person who was not a friend at all, Art Buchwald, who, who was a um, humor columnist, still is in Washington, um, and had written a uh, kind of a nasty play about Joe um, and never liked him, um, also received such photographs. So it was important for Joe to know who had received him and to get him back. Uh, well, Charlie delayed sending him just because he was uncomfortable. 
uh, and he went off on a, on a um, foreign trip, and he was gone for quite some time. When he got back, he gets a call from the CIA intermediary and said, Charlie, I thought you were going to send those photos over to Joe. And he said, well, I, I am, I am. And, and so, so he did, and he wrote a little note saying something like, uh, Dear Joe, uh, these came to me in the mail unsolicited. I want you to know that your friends uh, are behind you all the way, or some such sensitive thing like that. Uh, but he didn't sign it because he was uh, continued to be sort of uncomfortable in interjecting himself into a situation like that. Um, and Joe, of course, had to know whether these were the photos from Charlie or whether they were some other photos from someone else. So he had to call Charlie. Uh, Charlie says, um, uh, are you the one who sent these photos over here? Yes, I did, Joe. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, um, why didn't you sign it? And, and they said, well, I just didn't, uh, I didn't want to embarrass you, Joe. And, and so he said, well, thank you. But uh, Charlie Bartlett says that uh, he had never been a close friend of Joe Alsop's, but they had had a friendly relationship, friendly um, association over the years, and it was never quite the same after that. Is Charlie Bartlett still alive? Oh, yes. How did you find this story? I had heard about the story from a source uh, uh, who knew the Alsop's, who spoke anonymously um, and was a former CIA official. Um, um, and then I went to interview Charlie Bartlett, primarily about a famous article that he had written with Stuart Alsop uh, years earlier during the Kennedy years on the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in the course of that interview, I began to detect that Charlie was hinting at something, and the previous uh, episode sort of came back to me, and so uh, uh, Charlie uh, uh, revealed the details. Ed Yoder's book came out what year? I believe it came out last year. So this is all new, this, this is on the record very, very new, yes. Here's a clip from the 1984 interview about Stuart Alsop that I want to ask you about. Your brother Stuart, was he older or younger? Younger. I'm the oldest. And he died a long time ago. Ten, that's why I retired. What year did he die? About 10 years ago. 1974. Yeah, I just, you know, that was, we'd had a uh, wonderful time when we were partners, and then we were... He was my best friend in Washington, and and uh, and I saw him all the time, and I just didn't have the stomach to go on with uh, McCollum when when Stu died. You write a lot about the death, we, and I remember living mm -hmm. three years through mm -hmm. all the columns. He wrote about it. He uh, struggled with leukemia for three years, finally succumbed in 1974. Um, um, I, I, it's, we should talk about Stuart a little bit, because Joe was, um, Joe was an imperious person. Uh, he was arrogant, and he was a know-it-all. And towards the end of his life, his abilities as a journalist were diminishing as a result of his uh, lack of curiosity. He simply thought that he knew everything, whereas Stuart who was younger and, as I say, had lived in Joe's shadow for a fair amount of his career, um, never lost his curiosity and his ability to step back and analyze dispassionately uh, what was going on um, uh, in, um, in the corridors of power within Washington and throughout the world. And the result, in my view, is that Stewart, especially when he got that column in Newsweek in 1968, really emerged as the greater journalist. The greatest challenge and test of their careers was Vietnam, and I believe that Joe failed the test, uh, and Stewart passed the test with flying colors. This is not a question of whether they um, believed in the war or supported the war. Both of them did, but Stewart understood what was going on in Vietnam in a way that Joe did not. Uh, and so in my view, Stewart really emerges as um, um, a journalist of uh, real um, immense proportion in American post-war journalistic history. Why did Stuart Alsop decide to share his leukemia step by step, all the platelets and uh, transfusions and everything? The Alsops always enjoyed writing about themselves, and there was always a, a market because they were a fascinating um, 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 family with a rich tale. Um, um, but uh, he was uncomfortable initially when he first discovered he had leukemia and went to the hospital and wasn't clear what the what the um, uh, treatment was going to be and and he came out he was gone for a long time and the question was was he going to reveal this to his readers and explain why he'd been gone why the column hadn't appeared for several weeks 
Uh, he went to the uh, Washington bureau chief of Newsweek, uh, his good friend Mel Elfin, and showed him a column he had written and said, do you think that I should, uh, we should publish this? And Mel said, but of course. Uh, why wouldn't we? And Stuart said, well, I'm not so sure I'm comfortable. Um, and uh, they did, and it got such an incredible response that as this battle ensued, uh, Stuart decided that perhaps his readers were sort of interested. And sure enough, he, he did write about it intermittently. And then he wrote what I consider to be a courageous little book uh, about, about his life. He called it a sort of memoir. It's very chatty, anecdotal, a lot of funny stories about him and his family. Um, but he also tells about his battle with cancer. He was writing about his own death with the same dispassionate analytical rigor that he brought to writing about uh, what was happening to Nixon in Watergate. Uh, and it was quite a remarkable book. What was the brothers' relationship uh, during the cancer? Very, very close. Uh, Joe would go there all the time. Um, uh, he would take them um, soup and uh, martinis. Um, they loved martinis, especially Stuart. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, the friendship of the brothers was probably never more um, uh, tender than it was during those years. They had a stormy relationship, uh, but the, the, the uh, love between them was really quite something to behold. But uh, uh, Joe was a very difficult guy to uh, get along with, and especially when they were writing the column together, um, there were a lot of frictions within the family, and they argued endlessly uh, on political matters. It was just part of their lives. They loved it. They loved to go at each other, as their father had done with them earlier, and it was just part of... Um, part of life, but that was different from the frictions that ensued towards the end of their column writing period. I don't know whether you can reconstruct this or not. I found it in two different parts of your book. Um, this is the business of being elite, going to Harvard and Yale, Groton, being a part of the Anglo-Saxon family. Mm -hmm. And you, play, you, you show a, a, a time when Joe Alsop arrived at the Kennedy house in Georgetown and he found it a mess. An old hamburger on the, I don't know, on the table there, half eaten or something like that. Then what I'm trying to do is contrast this with the, they, they just seem to be, have a very difficult time going to Waco, Texas and to being in some of the basement restaurants of motels there and dealing with the food and when there was a wedding. Can you put all that together? Well, it was a little bit of a culture clash, and I think that the significance of that, that wedding and, and uh, Joe's letters to his stepson, uh, Billy Patton, uh, are where I get this material, because he, he, he went on at some length about the observations that they had uh, at this wedding. Let me put it together, though, just one more time. Mary jo Mary uh, Susan Mary. Susan Mary, I'm sorry, Patton's son marries a woman that he met on an airplane? Uh, that's actually, uh, that uh, would be uh, Stuart's son, Joe. Uh, his oldest son, uh, Joe, married a woman that he had met on an airplane. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's right. yeah. He was living in uh, Boston, and I think he had gone to MIT and was in the computer business even very early uh, in Boston, and she was working in Boston. She had um, um, uh, left uh, from, from college and at, at Texas University. I can't remember which one. Um, um, had taken a job in Boston largely to see the world, and they had met and fallen in love. Uh, and she was um, somebody that Joe just uh, highly prized. He thought she was just a wonderful catch. But she came from the, um, Ameri the big, broad American middle class. And it's interesting that no one of the Alsops throughout the, all the generations since they m first made their money in the shipping trade uh, um, uh, shipping ice down to the Bahamas and rum back in the, around, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, mid-18th uh, century, no one had ever married below their station. It wasn't done in those days. But, of course, the world was changing dramatically. The meritocracy, television, airplanes, um, um, the, the uh, coming out parties that were designed basically to make sure that that people of uh, like station married and met and married people of like station. All those things were in uh, very serious erosion. And so the wedding took place in Waco, and it was a very nice wedding. The, the um, uh, Candy was her name. Candy ate a lot, and she, sh her family had not met the Alsops, and, and they had not met them, and, and so there was a little bit of a culture clash. And, 
Joe wrote about this culture clash, um, he was somewhat amused. He felt that they probably thought that he was somewhat amusing also. We're strange, he said. Uh, we certainly uh, probably appear weird to them. But some of the, um, uh, the um, settings and some of the foods and everything were just not what they were used to. And he couldn't help but remarking upon that. And he couldn't eat? They, could, they only ate salad, I think? Um, that, uh, wouldn't, that would have been sort of typical of Joe. He once said to a friend of mine, Frank Mankiewicz, on a campaign trail, um, when Frank said, uh, Joe, uh, uh, we got in late one night to a hotel and they kept the kitchen open and said, Joe, uh, uh, you can have anything you want. And he had ordered like an apple and a salad. And he said, uh, 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 dear boy, I never eat hot foods in the provinces. <laughs> but yet he had been in Korea and had been uh, World War II. He'd been quite an adventurer, as a matter of fact, and he, um, he marched uh, at the company level in Korea, and he was, uh, you know, he was 40, he was not young, um, and um, I saw a lot of, saw a lot of um, adversity and, and didn't mind it at all. Back to when they were writing, what was, would be both Stuart and Joel Sub's peak years, and w how many people in this country at that year could read them? Well, let's just say, let's take the time when they were writing the column together. They had 200 newspapers with a circulation, combined circulation of about uh, 20 million. Uh, at the same time, they were writing in the Saturday Evening Post, which had a circulation at its peak during that period. It fluctuated somewhat, but at its peak of 6 million, with, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 200 newspapers with 25 million circulation combined. What years? Um, uh, mid uh, 50s to 1960, but the column broke up in, in 1958. Uh, and the Saturday Evening Post, they were writing regularly for the Post, and that had a circulation of 6 million with 20 million readers. So uh, they, had a, they had a huge circulation for those days. That was before television had, had gained the kind of uh, stature and status that it has now and reach. And Joe Alsop's own book, written with Adam Platt, which mm -hmm. came out what year? Oh, um, I would say, do I can remember this? He died in 89, and it, it was after that. I believe it was 91. Was this in the middle of your research, by the yeah, way? Yeah, it was. I was. I had the manuscript, uh, and I was working from the manuscript, and the book came out and made things a little easier. He said he never had a television. He told you that in that interview. And he said it in his book. But, and, he, and you asked him, you said, so there's not a television in this house. He said, not one that I own. And I don't know what kind of a, um, I don't know what uh, he was trying to say. I imagine that his hired help had television in their rooms. Uh, and uh, Catherine Graham of the Washington Post, the owner of the Washington Post, told me that, that he always seemed to manage to get a television for, for uh, you know, um, um, big political nights, uh, like, uh, you know, primary nights or the Iowa caucuses or something. So I don't know where he managed to glom onto television sets, but he didn't like television, he didn't watch television, he read endlessly. We've got some video from that series of interviews we did, and, but you write in your book about the end where he had to sell the Dunbarton home and where this video is coming from, and it will show outside in Georgetown, is a home that he actually rented. Yes, yes. Uh, in the end, did he have any money left? And we're going to see uh, some of the insides here in just a moment. That's one of the streets. In, I think it was End Street where he lived. There's some photos of the Kennedy brothers on his wall that had signatures on it. What do you do? I mean, at the I end, don't know what his, I don't know what his estate was um, uh, at the end. I do know that some of his family members felt that he, um, he um, uh, ate into uh, uh, the Capitol. Um, as opposed to just the income from the capital, uh, maybe more than he ought to have. But I don't really know. I didn't get into uh, what the st uh, state was. What was his life like at the end? Oh, I think he did quite well. I think that uh, he, had, he had amassed a tremendous amount of uh, artifacts and um, uh, artistic uh, objects uh, over the years, including during his uh, years during the war in China. And they were worth a fair amount, and so was his house. Um, did you say he got cranky in the end? He knew he was cranky. Oh, yes, he did. He did. In fact, the, even before he retired, he knew that he'd gotten cranky. There's this kind of a touching letter he wrote to Scotty Reston, who was uh, one of the giants of uh, post-war American journalism, along with the Alsop brothers and, and Walter Lippmann, probably. And um, uh, he uh, sort of lamented that uh, their controversies had, uh, 
seem to interfere with their friendship. And he said, uh, as soon as I retire, I'm never again going to discuss politics. Of course, he did. I think that lasted about a week and a half. Um, but uh, the world was changing on him, and he didn't like a lot of the changes that he saw. Do any journalists today have the kind of influence that he had? No. Or Stuart? No. Do you think they should? Oh, the world's changed, you know. Everything that happens in history happens for good and ill. And I, I don't really uh, have an opinion on that. But uh, the, the, the ability to have that kind of influence came from your ability to have um, a, a, a significant position within an entity, which was print journalism, which was, at that time, the, the foremost way in which most people receive their news. That does, doesn't exist anymore. Does Bill Clinton have a relationship with any news person like Joe Alsop or Stewart did with the presidents, Lyndon Johnson and Jack Kennedy? I don't know that, that he does. I don't believe that he does. What did you think when you found all the letters of, uh, you know, he, Joe Alsop would write to President Kennedy and say, you're just the greatest thing that ever happened, or Lyndon Johnson, you're on the right track, keep it up. Does any of that kind of thing go on today? Well, I don't think it does. I mean, uh, it shouldn't go on. And, and um, I think that most people who, most journalists certainly, and I think probably most other people who read this book will say, there are a lot of transgressions here. I mean, this guy is purporting to be a, um, a, a detached analytical newsman, and he's uh, really snuggling up to a lot of his sources. But he was a columnist, of course. He wasn't an objective um, a reporter who's uh, simply giving facts. He, he, was a, he, he was a columnist, so that would be part of his defense, no doubt. Um, but uh, from almost the very beginning, Joe got very close to his sources, and probably most people would say too close. How did this book turn out for you in the end? How did it turn out? Is it the way you wanted it? Are you oh, it's, um, I think so. Um, when you work as uh, long and hard on a project uh, such as this, of this magnitude, uh, uh, you almost have to say that it came out the way you wanted it or you might go crazy. <laughs> Bob Murray is the author, Taking on the World, The Allsop Brothers, published by Viking. Thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you.